So let's do what we often do when we don't know how to proceed. Let's start with an example. And for this example, let's take x and y the same, which is just one of our sequence spaces, little lp, in which case we can think of the equation ax equals b as an equation of an infinite matrix applied to an infinite vector being equal to another infinite vector where this vector here is our unknown x. And let me denote the entries of this vector x, which are real or complex numbers, by x1, x2, and so on, where now I use superscript instead of subscript, because we need subscript for um, well, xn being the sequence of solutions. And of course, we use brackets, so nobody will confu confuse superscripts with exponents. Okay, and then in the same style, this vector here is b, and we denote its entries by b1, b2, again with superscript in brackets for the same reason. Okay, then this matrix here must represent the operator A. Um, well, let's just label the matrix entries as we always do. And I think this time, is there, is, this time there is no danger in using subscript indices. Okay, and if you read this equality out, it says A11 times first unknown plus A12 times second unknown plus and so on equals right hand side B1. Okay, and then the same with a second equation in the second right hand side and so on. So in short, this system here is a linear system for infinitely many unknowns and it has infinitely many equations. And of course, this sounds kind of fair, but tough. So what you want is you want to reduce this problem into a linear problem that has finitely many equations for finitely many unknowns. And to make this system fair, you should of course have the same number of equations and unknowns. Let's call it little n. Okay, and then how could you do this reduction step? Well, you could of course, from these infinitely many equations here, use the first n equations. And from these infinitely many unknowns, use the first n unknowns and see what you can say. So if you ignore all equations that are coming after number n plus one, that means you just cut this system off here after position n. And if you ignore all the unknowns after the n, then you would of course in your matrix just cut off all the columns that come after number n here. Okay, and the same with rows. So what is left is this finite nice little system where you could denote this matrix here by a n and it just has the same entries as the original matrix only that you're cutting off everything that comes behind the nth column and below the nth row and you could call this right hand side here bn and also this has the same entries as the original right hand side only that you're ignoring everything that comes after entry number n and this vector of unknowns here is the vector that we will denote by xn and now n is in subscript but of course dn unknowns solving these n equalities here will in general not be the same as the first n of infinitely many unknowns solving these infinitely many equations. So unlike with the right hand side and matrix entries, these 
entries of the unknown vector will not be just copies of these entries here. They will be different in general, and they will depend on little n. And that's why we need this somewhat complicated labeling here. Okay, and now you can see why we have been using subscripts here, because we need the superscripts here and both super and subscripts here. Now this is of course a very natural idea of reducing the infinite dimensional problem to an n dimensional one. And that's why people are doing it very often and that's why people are using certain names for this. So this matrix here is called finite section of the infinite matrix A. And this whole idea of reducing the system in this style is called finite section method. And because this phrase is a bit clumsy, we often just abbreviate it by FSM. Looking at this, it seems perfectly clear that AN is a finite rank operator. It's, it's just a finite matrix. You can store it on a computer, no problem. And it's perfectly clear uh, that this can be invertible. It's, it's an N by N matrix. Yes, of course, it's invertible as such a matrix. What is not so clear is in which sense your sequence of operators A n could converge to the infinite matrix A, or similarly in which sense these finite vectors x n should converge to the unknown and to be determined vector x. Um, okay, and to make that more clear, we need some more notations. And the first thing we will do is to introduce this so-called truncation operator that takes an infinite vector and deletes everything that comes after position n. But in fact the output vector will still be an infinite vector only that it has zeros where there used to be data number n plus one and so on. Okay, we will denote this operator by Pn, because of course it depends on n. We have to tell it where to cut off. And we call it Pn because it's a projection operator. Because clearly if you apply this operation again, you would again copy the first n components here and put zeros after them. But then of course you get the same vector that you did have before. So in other words, Pn applied twice is the same as Pn applied once. So indeed, it's a projection. So let me keep this conclusion and delete the red bits. And then let's use this truncation operator or projector to understand the finite section method better. And to do so, we will look at the composition Pn, A, Pn. So here you start with your infinite vector x, and then first apply Pn, then next apply A. So remember, A is reflected by the infinite matrix up here, which multiplies an infinite vector. So this vector has infinitely many, possibly non-zero entries, but each of these sums is now finite because our input vector only lives on the first n entries. Okay, and then at the end you again apply Pn, which just takes this vector here, only keeps the first n entries and deletes the rest, meaning putting it to zero. Okay, so what's happening? Well, this Pn here is cutting down from infinitely many to just finitely many unknowns. Um, then applying the operator A, we end up with infinitely many equations in finitely many unknowns, well at least the left-hand sides of these equations. Okay, and then applying Pn again, which is this one here, 
you also truncate these equations and you end up with finitely many equations in finitely many unknowns, but again, just the left hand sides. So you can abbreviate the result as this. So you've got this infinite matrix here, which in the top n by n corner is just the original matrix, but all the rest is zeros. And you're applying this to our infinite and untruncated vector of the unknowns. Okay, so the composition Pn A P N brings us directly from this input vector to this result over here. And the matrix that we called A N before, which is this one, is still visible in this computation and in this expression Pn A P N. Well, you can see it here, right? 